Καλησπέρα σε όλους. Νομίζω ότι μπορούμε να ξεκινήσουμε το επόμενο τραπέζι. Uh, good afternoon to uh, everybody. It is a great, uh, great pleasure to introduce uh, uh, Professor uh, Rob Story um, in Sheffield, uh, UK, who is a worldwide expert in uh, atherothrombosis and uh, part of uh, numerous uh, studies like Plato, uh, Augustus, and um, it is definitely a pleasure to see you, Rob. Great, thank you very much. Pleasure to be here. Sorry I can't be there in person. The weather looks much nicer than here. <laughs> it's really much nicer, yes. It is nicer and uh, we expect you probably <laughs> next year. Yeah, I hope so. Okay, thank you. So, um, can you see my screen? Oh, uh, uh, yeah. Yes, right now. Yeah. Fantastic. Yes, you're okay. So, so it's my pleasure to talk about antiplatelet drugs in coronary artery disease and some of the latest topics. It's certainly becoming uh, quite a complex area. Uh, I have quite a number of disclosures, some of them relevant to this talk. So firstly, antiplatelet therapy and primary prevention. There's been some recent evidence, for example, in diabetes patients showing quite a limited effect of aspirin, not really increasing over time versus placebo. Uh, and an increase in bleeding with uh, meta-analysis showing reduction in myocardial infarction, no influence on all-cause mortality, and uh, counteracting increase in bleeding, including intracranial hemorrhage. Now, in other type of primary prevention, i.e. those with coronary artery disease who've not had a previous MI or stroke, the theme of study added to Cagrilor to aspirin versus placebo and showed, showed a small reduction 10% relative risk reduction in CV death, MI, or stroke, but at the cost of more TIMI major bleeding uh, without overall net benefit, although there did seem to be more uh, evidence of benefit in the PCI population. And in fact, looking at the evidence, the FDA decided to update the label for Ticagrelor to include patients who'd not had an MI or stroke, but were at high risk, uh, including those with type 2 diabetes. So there's a bit of evidence if we're particularly concerned about ischemic risk, um, particularly in patients with diabetes, and then this is a, an option we could consider. Now, there's quite a lot of talk about monotherapy um, rather than dual antiplatelet therapy, and how effective is that at preventing stent thrombosis? Well, if we look at clopidogrel. We have major concerns here related to inter-individual variability. And comparing on the left a placebo versus ticagrelor study with a clopidogrel versus ticagrelor study on the right, using the same assay, we can see quite an overlap between placebo platelet reactivity and clopidogrel platelet reactivity. And so about 30% of patients on clopidogrel, no real um, antiplatelet effect evidence. And so if we're talking about just relying on clopidogrel for preventing stent thrombosis, it's a bit of a gamble, um, particularly if you don't measure platelet reactivity with a reliable system. On the other hand, we have studies looking beyond the um, major stent thrombosis risk, for example, host exam, looking at clopidogrel monotherapy versus aspirin monotherapy from six to 18 months after PCI, showing a reduction in the primary composite endpoint with clopidogrel versus aspirin. On the other hand, there was numerically uh, but not significantly more all-cause death in the clopidogrel group. And this is a sort of recurring issue with some of the thenopyridine studies that they certainly reduce MI and stent thrombosis, um, but have uncertain impact on all-cause mortality. And one of the things to be aware of is that clopidogrel does have a weak off-target anti-inflammatory effect uh, that we saw in the Plato study here comparing ticagrelor with um, clopidogrel. And during clopidogrel treatment, there was a slight reduction in leukocyte count, including neutrophil count. And this, the um, impact of this is uncertain, but it's possible it has an impact on long-term events. Now, certainly prasugrel monotherapy is more uh, reliable than clopidogrel monotherapy in terms of antiplatelet effect. Here, a study that we did in diabetes patients, three-way crossover. Uh, this is ADP-induced aggregation. So aspirin in red um, 
is really like placebo in this particular assay. Clopidogrel, we see this spread of response, and prasugrel has a more reliable antiplatelet effect, but still a few patients with high platelet reactivity. And maintenance dosing of prasugrel wasn't intended to completely consistently um, suppress PTY12 to a high level, so we do see a bit of variability with it. We then come on to the um, issue of anticoagulant treated patients um, with atrial fibrillation predominantly after either PCS or ACS. And this leaves us with a conundrum. How do we safely prevent coronary, particularly stent thrombosis, and prevent cardiac thromboembolism? Because coronary thrombosis is a high shear um, event, whereas cardiac thromboembolism in AF uh, relates to thrombosis forming under low shear in the left atrial appendage. And we have our oral antithrombotic drug mechanisms of action, the anticoagulants blocking the formation and or action of thrombin, which not only causes coagulation, that's fibrin formation, but also activates platelets. So anticoagulants have direct or indirect antiplatelet effect. We have aspirin working on another pathway and P2Y12 inhibitors working on another pathway. If we block all three of these together, we have quite a profound effect on platelets as well as the coagulation system. And the Augusta study firstly showed that using a NOAC apixaban twice daily at its normal AF dose was much safer than using warfarin in terms of major bleeding or clinically relevant bleeding. And also using a placebo, i.e. a dual combination of anticoagulant and P2Y12 inhibitor was much safer than using triple combination, including aspirin, with quite a profound reduction in significant bleeding when you drop the aspirin. And this was in within a week or two of the uh, event. In terms of stroke and stent thrombosis rates, there seemed to be uh, more favorable uh, efficacy with apixaban versus warfarin, but uh, not statistically significant difference in stent thrombosis, this being a low event rate. Whereas with aspirin versus placebo, aspirin was associated with numerically lower rates of stent thrombosis versus placebo. And so this really leaves us with a conundrum. We can certainly know how to prevent bleeding, but can we do so without causing stent thrombosis? Well, we put some um, recommendations into the 2019 ESC guidelines on chronic coronary syndromes, which were replicated in the more recent non-SD elevation ACS guidelines, recommending a NOAC in eligible patients in preference to a VKA such as warfarin. They're clearly much safer uh, when you combine with antiplatelet drugs. And then slightly complicated uh, recommendations for when to stop aspirin. Early cessation of aspirin within a week if the risk of stent thrombosis is low or if you're particularly concerned about bleeding risk or triple therapy if you're more concerned about stent thrombosis and think the risk of that outweighs bleeding risk um, for up to a month, generally not recommended beyond a month. But again, coming back to this issue about clopidogrel being little different to placebo, um, but also the flip side of that is that clopidogrel in about 30% of patients is similar in its antiplatelet effect to ticagrelor and similar to about 50% of patients with prasugrel given more overlap there. So this is uh, an issue and it may be preferable to use a more reliable P2Y12 inhibitor such as ticagrelor or prasugrel, but it's important that you don't do that in a triple combination. So you can use them in a dual combination in preference or instead of using a triple combination with aspirin and clopidogrel. And that is my preference in clinical practice, but we have a gap in the evidence to really guide us as to what the optimum regimen is. But undoubtedly, individualization is the key. What about after MI in terms of dual therapy? So back to our sinus rhythm patients. Now we have the Pegasus study showing 90 and 60 milligrams twice daily of ticagrelor added to aspirin better than aspirin alone in terms of CV death MI or stroke at the expense of more bleeding um, but without an increase in fatal bleeding. 
Now, when we did an analysis, we looked at um, patients who had bleeding risk factors consisting of low hemoglobin or prior hospitalization for bleeding. We found that that group within Pegasus, which also excluded other high bleeding risk conditions, didn't seem to benefit. Whereas if we took patients without these bleeding risk factors, the more ischemic risk they had, the greater the numerical reduction in cardiovascular death, which was nominally significant in those with an additional ischemic risk factor beyond um, uh, recent MI. We also have another dual uh, antithrombotic regimen available to us in terms of rivaroxaban, very low dose, 2.5 milligrams twice daily plus aspirin, uh, was superior to aspirin alone in preventing ischemic events. But again, at the expense of more bleeding, uh, a numerical but not significant increase in fatal bleeding um, and overall a net benefit in this population. But again, this excluded patients with high bleeding risk conditions. So again, the 2019 ESC guidelines made recommendations for using a second antithrombotic drug on top of aspirin for long-term prevention in patients with high risk of ischemic events. And we provided what uh, definition for that. And without high bleeding risk, i.e. without conditions associated with high bleeding risk. This is slightly different to the, um, the high bleeding risk consortium recommendations, which include um, chronic kidney disease as a minor bleeding criterion. But those are patients who have a particular net benefit with dual antithrombotic therapy. So we can come up with quite complex algorithms. Uh, this is one uh, based on one that we published. I'm not going to go through the detail of this, but the essence is you look for the ischemic risk. If they have high ischemic risk, you then look for the bleeding risk. And if they don't have a high bleeding risk condition, then you uh, extend dual therapy long term. But it gets more complicated because we've now got evidence for Chicago law monotherapy after acute coronary syndrome or complex PCI. So coming back to this, ticagrelor blocking PTY12, this is a separate pathway to aspirin. So if we stop aspirin, then we lead to increase in platelet reactivity. As shown in this uh, sub-study of global leaders, when we stop the aspirin, you see an increase in platelet reactivity to collagen. And don't believe otherwise people saying that you don't see a difference in platelet reactivity. You certainly do when you stop aspirin. So somewhat predictably in twilight study where aspirin was stopped three months post PCI versus continuing ticagrelor and aspirin for a further 12 months, uh, there was a reduction in significant bleeding, uh, quite a profound reduction. And this is mainly driven by an increase in platelet reactivity. But despite that, there was no difference in terms of ischemic events in this population. And uh, so no increase in death, MI or stroke when you drop the aspirin. Now, if we look at the subgroups, uh, most of the subgroups, um, the message was the same, but CKD and multivessel coronary artery disease, a point estimate favored dual antiplatelet therapy versus monotherapy. Not greatly, but I think this gives you hints that we don't have much power in these studies for looking at high-risk subgroups. And in an editorial we um, published recently, we see that um, the point estimate for MACE in Pegasus with aspirin and ticagrelor was similar to the point estimate in Twilight for aspirin and ticagrelor versus single antiplatelet therapy alone with similar increases in bleeding. So I think we have to be a bit cautious with this, um, these monotherapy studies when we're thinking about high long-term ischemic risk patients. But here's an algorithm, again, another editorial, um, proposing a potential algorithm um, for those three months post ACS with no thrombotic events on aspirin and ticagrelor and not requiring anticoagulation. First, you look at the ischemic risk. If they have a high ischemic risk, then you say, do they have conditions associated with increased bleeding? And if they're not 
high ischemic risk or they do have high bleeding risk, then ticagrelor or monotherapy seems a good option. If they have high ischemic risk without high bleeding risk, then long-term dual antiplatelet therapy seems a good option. But yet, th this type of algorithm is yet to be supported in uh, clinical guidelines or recommendations. Now, there's a lot of talk about prasugrel versus ticagrelor after ACS-PCI, driven by the results of the ISR-REACT study, ISR-REACT 5, which showed better outcomes with a prasugrel-based strategy, where prasugrel was started, if necessary, after PCI, versus a ticagrelor pretreatment strategy, uh, where ticagrelor was given before the angiogram. And part of the difference in events was driven by definite stent thrombosis increase with ticagrelor versus prasugrel. Now, this immediately raised an alarm bell in my mind because our experience in Sheffield, where we've looked at many thousands of patients treated with ticagrelor, is that the stent thrombosis rates are extremely low, particularly after in 2015, we introduced a guideline locally to use a short regimen of tyrofiban in opiate treated primary PCI patients. And we, we found that that prevented the acute stent thrombosis associated with morphine in those individuals. And so that dealt with the acute stent thrombosis risk, which applied to both ticagrelor and prasugrel treated patients. But in our mainly ticagrelor treated population beyond 24 hours, we saw almost no uh, definite stent thrombosis rates. And this really implies that in the ISR-REACT study, the increase in definite stent thrombosis, for whatever reason, was likely related to poor adherence that we're not seeing in our own practice. And that may relate to how soon you start to ticagrelor before patients are discharged. The other emerging issue with ticagrelor is an advantage of reversibility because it binds reversibly. We can um, create uh, systems for uh, reversing its effects on platelet reactivity as shown here with a reversal antibody that's in phase three study. Um, showing how the antibody, uh, within a few minutes, reverses the effects of ticagrelor. And there's other ways of removing ticagrelor, such as the cytosorb system in patients undergoing cardiopulmonary bypass. And this reversibility also links better with um, when you're giving ticagrelor after a reversible agent, such as either cangrelor or, in development, uh, salatogrel. Uh, whereas thenopyridines, you can get negative interactions with the parenteral P2Y12 inhibitors. So there are a number of advantages of ticagrelor that have yet to be fully exploited in clinical practice. So, so to summarize, aspirin or dual therapy have limited or no net benefit in general primary prevention of CV events. And of course, there's a question in those who don't have symptoms due to coronary artery disease and you just pick it up on imaging, whether they should have antiplatelet therapy. And that's not been answered. AF patients undergoing PCI or with ACS, early cessation of aspirin and use of a full dose NOAC and P2Y12 inhibitor offers the optimal balance of stroke prevention and bleeding, but the impact of early aspirin cessation uh, is uncertain and the choice of P2Y12 inhibitor, particularly given clopidogrel's unreliability, is uncertain. My current preference is to use um, apixaban twice daily with ticagrelor twice daily and drop the aspirin early, uh, i.e. immediately after PCI. Um, but then you have to sort of down titrate at some stage. Long-term dual therapy in patients with sinus rhythm should be considered with those for high ischemic risk who don't have high bleeding risk conditions. We see that from a number of studies now. But excluding those with anemia or prior hospitalization for bleeding from long-term therapy. Anticagrelor monotherapy, on the other hand, is an option at three months post ACS in those without high long term ischemic risk or in those with high bleeding risk. And we'll see ongoing debate about the pros and cons of prasugrel versus ticagrelor, um, given the results of ISR React 5, which has impacted on guideline recommendations. But these conflict with our real world evidence showing ticagrelor highly effective for preventing stent thrombosis with reversibility being an emerging advantage. So I'd like to thank you very much for your attention and happy to take any questions. Okay, Rob, thank you. Hi again from me. Hi. Uh, it's
very nice to see you again. But I was hoping that you will travel finally. <laughs> yeah. I will yes, see you first. <laughs> but but uh, you had some problems, okay. Yeah, so the government just tomorrow. decided <laughs> the government decided to change the guidelines from next Monday, so I was just <laughs> not okay. in time. Okay, let's hope that uh, next year you will manage. So, um, do we have any questions from the audience? Uh, yes. Uh, uh, so, uh, let me ask you some questions, and then Dimitris will come up with some probably some questions. Um, so, uh, what about uh, 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 what about these patients? Uh, do you, can you describe the profile of the patient that will benefit finally from this uh, rivaroxaban two point five? twice a day uh, for long term, because there is much debate upon it. I think we don't have enough data, and the industry pushes us to use it, but we don't have enough data. So can you describe us, from your point of view, which is the exact profile of the patient that will benefit from this uh, dosage of uh, rivaroxaban? Mm -hmm. So I think particularly patients who are although they're in sinus rhythm are at risk of venous thromboembolism or cardiac thromboembolism, I think they particularly uh, can benefit because there is quite a substantial stroke risk reduction with this dual strategy. So patients with um, you know, ischemic heart failure, those who've had prior venous thromboembolism, um, and those with peripheral arterial disease as well, they seem to particularly benefit uh, with this dual combination. So I think there is overlap with those who you'd select long-term dual antiplatelet therapy for, uh, such as we see with aspirin ticagrelor in Pegasus. Um, but there does seem to be slightly differential effects. So dual antiplatelet therapy seems better at preventing coronary thrombotic events, whereas this aspirin river oxbound combination potentially seems a bit better at preventing stroke. So I think that to a, you know, perhaps helps guide you um, as to those who would benefit long term from this uh, aspirin river rivaroxaban combination, but clear net benefit, um, particularly when you exclude patients with high bleeding risk uh, conditions or anemia. Okay, thank you very much. Dimitri. Okay. Uh, oh, got a question? Can you step up microphone? Thomas. Hello, thank you very much for your nice and excellent talk. Uh, who, would you consider all patients with subclinical atherosclerosis as secondary prevention? Would you prescribe aspirin for them? So I think that's that's a good question because we and we don't really, as I say, have the evidence for that. I mean, we're increasingly seeing more patients um, with subclinical atherosclerosis from CT coronary angiography and I think that the priority really in those patients should be high dose high intensity lipid lowering therapies and rigorous blood pressure management um, more so necessarily than aspirin so if I see a bit of plaque on CT particularly if it's not in the left main stem or proximal AD then it doesn't necessarily you know induce me to prescribe aspirin because I think, and particularly if there's a lot of reversible uh, risk factors such as high cholesterol, um, high blood pressure that you can tackle first. Uh, whereas if patients have got more extensive um, plaque, uh, worse disease on imaging, then I think there is more basis um, for using aspirin in those patients. But we really need more evidence. And, um, you know, the more that we employ lipid lowering and blood pressure management and potentially other strategies that should diminish the need for um, antiplatelet therapy in those with subclinical atherosclerosis. Okay, thank you very much. So, yeah. Just a quick question. Uh, we got a patient that uh, uh, underwent the PCI and now we have to use triple therapy. Um, and uh, oral anticoagulant plus uh, DAP. So um, if this patient has a high risk of uh, stent thrombosis, uh, 
uh, would you consider uh, aspirin plus dual antiplatelet like aspirin, clopidogrel, and uh, oral anticoagulation for a month, aspirin, usually aspirin for a month, versus a cagrolol and uh, oral anticoagulation? Just omit aspirin for a month, yeah. or uh, because there's not enough data, but it looks reasonable to do that. Yes, there isn't enough data. I mean, the concern with triple therapy with clopidogrel is that sometimes, you know, that's like dual therapy with aspirin and anticoagulant if you have no clopidogrel response. But for high responders to clopidogrel, it's no different to combining ticagrelor, or aspirin and an anticoagulant. The advantage to using ticagrelor and uh, apixaban, say, without aspirin is you've got a very predictable effect. Whereas with triple therapy with clopidogrel, you have a rather unpredictable effect. Now, the other thing is that anticoagulants do have direct or indirect antiplatelet effects, which may be similar in magnitude to what you see with aspirin. So if you're giving an anticoagulant regimen that spreads the anticoagulant effect over 24 hours, i.e. a twice daily one, that may be similar efficacy to um, aspirin, particularly when you combine it with a P2Y12 inhibitor. Now, we need more data on this. It's a bit theoretical. But so far, I've treated quite a lot of patients with a pix of anticagral or dropping the aspirin after PCI, and it seems to have been a successful strategy in terms of getting that right balance. Um, so that tends to be my preference, um, that dual strategy rather than triple therapy, um, you know, even straight after PCI. Uh, Rob, uh, considering the same uh, issue, uh, so you said to, uh, during your talk that you use uh, 2.5 milligrams of uh, apixaban twice a day. No, no, I no. Mine no, with the <laughs> this is This is a kind of label or not? Sorry. No, no, I use full dose apixaban. I always use full dose apixaban. Um, right. The, the 2.5, that was a river oxaban compass study uh, for um, combining. No, okay. No, yeah, I thought so that you talked about five, uh, 2.5 apixaban. So the, so the message is that you use the right dose, okay? Five milligrams twice a day plus ticagrelor, okay? Uh, absolutely, yes. Yes. Yo, so you love ticagrelor. <laughs> okay. You are a great <laughs> fan. So well, we... well, I th well, I think the, the advantage is that it gives a very high level of P2Y12 inhibition very consistently. Uh, and so you know exactly where you are with it. Uh, and that's an, an advantage when you're dropping aspirin um, after PCI. Okay. Uh, and what about your preference according to uh, Prasugrel? So I tell, think us tell us the profile of the patient you are, you are using uh, Prasugrel. So I most often use Prasugrel in elective sort of stable angina patients who are having PCI, often they're pre-treated before PCI with clopidogrel. And then you're a bit concerned about the stent thrombosis risk for whatever reason, then I'll often switch them from clopidogrel to prasugrel because it's an easy, it's an easy switch uh, with a sort of predictable antiplatelet effect uh, in those patients who have higher risk of stent thrombosis. I tend not to use clopidogrel if I'm at all concerned about stent thrombosis risk uh, because we don't have routine platelet function monitoring available to us uh, generally in the UK because of expense issues. So, um, and prasugrel is now generic and cheaper. So, uh, mm. so if I'm concerned about stent thrombosis risk in an elective patient, I tend to switch them to prasugrel then. In, uh... Any other question from the audience? And just a few words about the uh, this reversibility of ticagrelor. About this uh, this new drug, is 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 it uh, IV use? Is it a pill? What is it? And uh, what do you think for the future? I think we definitely need this kind of substance for the everyday clinical routine, especially before. Uh, if we have a patient taking these uh, drugs and uh, if he's planning a surgery or if he, hmm. if he has an, emergen an emergency surgery. So it's... Yeah, I, th I think, you know, these antidotes certainly uh, are helpful in 
you know, individual cases and the ability to reverse Dicagrilor, you know, with this intravenous antidote um, certainly could be an advantage. Obviously, there will be sort of expense issues related to that, um, which, have, you know, we'll find out in the future. Um, but that's an advantage compared to thenopyridines, clopidogrel, prasugrel, which are irreversible. The only way of reversing their effects is with platelet transfusion. And platelet transfusions have been associated with increased morbidity um, because of you know in, inflammatory effects and others so so i think this sort of very clean way of reversing an antiplatelet drug effect um you know is likely to be uh, an advantage in the future when this uh, antidote is available okay. okay rob thank you again very much for your presence and your uh, talk it was excellent thank you very much um and i hope that we will see you again next year okay thank you nice to see you it was a great <laughs> pleasure thank you all right cheers